Hello there, thank you for joining me and welcome to Tough Conversations on Resilient Wednesday. For, for those of you joining us for the very first time, welcome to the Be Well COVID-19 Free Wellbeing Series. I am Joy Ling from Singapore and I'm a positive hypnotherapist, also known as the Superpower Activator. I use positive psychology tools and hypnotherapy to empower people to celebrate strength-based whole brain living. So this Be Well COVID-19 Free Wellbeing series is in support of the World Health Organization. Stay in alignment with your well-being and be supported with our Be Well series. We are doing this to support your well-being in this pandemic and more importantly, because we believe that you deserve a flourishing life and you have what it takes to achieve that and we are here to support you. That is our promise in joy. So please share this Facebook Live now with your friends so that we can all be well and be strong together. This is how we're going to deliver our promise of support. It includes a Strength and Joy podcast on Anchor FM and on Spotify. We, have a, we are healthy, well, and connected despite COVID-19 Facebook page. There is also a private Strength and Joy podcast Facebook group. There's a Super Pack Joy Link YouTube channel. Um, there's new well-being content on Super Monday, Resilient Wednesday, and Self-Care Friday on this page, Super Pack with Joy Method. There are a few shows uh, available, which is the Strengths with Joy Show, Whole Brain and Healing with Joy Show, and Celebrating She is Strong. Super Monday is where we explore how to develop your strength. So make your Mondays super powered with us. And in this pandemic, resilience is the name of the game. Applying science-based research findings into actionable strategies that you can apply for yourself and share with your family and friends to become more resilient. Let's be pandemic-proof together. On Self-Care Friday, we will learn about tools and techniques that we can use to apply for ourselves whenever we feel stressed. So take responsibility for your own self-care and for those under your care. We have a Strengths of Joy show where we chat with other positive psychology experts and brave souls who have rise up to my strengths challenge to share their insights with us. So remember to share this free well-being resource with other people. Share our Facebook Live now so that your friends can learn to be resilient together with us. Besides developing your prevalent and your character strengths, Learning how to tap on your all the potential of your brain unleashes your best and stronger self. Therapy can help to support us in feeling whole again to make unleashing our strengths into the world more compelling. So join in our conversations with experts in whole brain and healing with joy show. Women are phenomenally and amazingly strong and how to activate their strengths faithfully daily in loving service of others, often at the cost of neglecting their own well-being. It is time to celebrate the strengths of this phenomenal woman that we live with, work with, and come in contact with. So celebrating She Is Strong show is an acknowledgement of their contributions to all. So welcome to Tough Conversations on Resilient Wednesday. Here is where we will learn tools and techniques how to be resilient with real life stories. So as an accredited resilient at work coach, you can imagine this is one of my favorite topics besides strength development. So today we're going to talk about resilience on a very real level with a very special guest, Eva. Eva is a Soviet era survivor and we can only imagine what she has been through in her growing up years living in that time and in that part of the world. What are the precious life lessons about resilience and the best of humans that we can learn from her experience? Lieutenant's departure from the USSR on the March 11, 1990 triggered a year of turmoil that led to the collapse of the Soviet Union in December 1991. While Lieutenant have since enjoyed impressive economic growth, it also struggles with some of Europe's highest rates of depression, suicide, and alcoholism. Social scientists have made it clear that all the symptoms are outcomes of collective trauma that involve various limitations, 
such as like a twisted and dual identity that in uh, during the Soviet times and a constant fear of expressing feelings and thoughts. The Soviet regime put a lot of effort into not only preventing resistance, but also in ensuring loyalty. So this idolized system of education controlled the young people and in addition, other public organizations, the apparatus of propaganda, the total civilian of the citizens, the isolation from the free world were all employed for this purpose. So what was it? What was life like living under the Soviet regime in a world of curved mirrors? And how the events, beliefs, and values were affected by the Soviet propaganda? How did communism affect her identity? And how did she overcome her loss of identity and security? What did she do to rebuild herself? And what valuable life lessons emerged for her? from surviving the Soviet Union regime. Eva is a cultural, organizational culture trainer, having lived and worked in Germany, Russia, Ukraine, Singapore, and Switzerland. She has 20 over years of holding various managerial positions within sales, marketing, HR, uh, general management functions, and multicultural, cross-industrial environment and international organizations. She believes that individuals are constantly craving for identity and um, distinct traits that allows them to stand out, to be unique. And she's an advocator that identity plays an important role in shaping our principles and morals as well as our mental well-being. And because of her background, she faced great challenges trying to rebuild her own solid sense of self and developing her new identity, values, and self-worth. Today, Eva is an active member of various social charity and community organizations, using her invaluable life experiences and academic knowledge. She empowers others in her work and in her charitable endeavors. So without further ado, please help me to welcome Eva. Hi, Eva. Good morning from Lithuania. I, what I don't time know what is it now? To, now it's almost half past 11, so I'm very fresh, you know, still not tired. And uh, hello to all listeners. It's very nice to be here. Thank you, Joy, for inviting me to your amazing show. I think you're doing a great job by encouraging others, by real examples. That's very strong. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eva, and thank you for combining your superpowers with mine as well for this episode where we can share uh, valuable life lessons with our audience. So uh, let's start off with, tell us a bit more about yourself. Well, I'm Lithuanian born, a uh, citizen of the world. As you mentioned, I lived in several countries and I worked there and uh, lived there. Uh, uh, for now, for today, I'm a cultural trainer. I'm working with big companies and also introducing the strength leadership because I think it's very important topic to, to introduce to companies. And uh, yeah, so traveling world and um, making sure that people are getting better, that the organizations are treating people well, that uh, they're flourishing, that uh, families also like I'm doing personal coaching so trying to make world better place same like you <laughs> beautiful it's really amazing uh, given uh, your background your growing up years how from that point you are where you are today you know uh, making contributions to make the world a better place so let's dive straight in uh, if it's okay with you so let's start with, uh, can you share with us, how was it like living under the Soviet Union regime? It's a very interesting experience. It looks like that today than I was living. I, at that time, I didn't really understand where I live because it's a, it was a big, giant bubble of propaganda. Uh, if we will take examples, you know, we didn't know that other world exists in general because we were not allowed to travel. We were not allowed to listen to foreign music. We didn't have international chains or brands or like restaurants. Uh, we were uh, told that our families are not most important, that we are family of Lenin, 
uh, as you know, as the previous leader of Soviet Union, we had three levels to achieve in our lives. So to 10 years, we were like grandchildren of Lenin. Then from 10 years to 15, we were like uh, children of Lenin. And after, our, or after 15, 16 years, we were either friends or enemies of Lenin. And of course, we wanted to be friends with <laughs> Lenin. So we were listening to everything what you know, communist propaganda was announcing, and uh, there were no left-handed people. There was not allowed to be left-handed. Uh, there were no handicapped people because our society was based off ideology that we're super country. So there were no crimes. There were no uh, plane crashes. Uh, there were no um, bad things going on in society. Uh, there were no homosexualists, there were no love, there were no sex, there were nothing which could disturb this ideology. So we lived very much framed and our like uh, identity, my identity was that I'm a part of superpower, that I'm part of something so big. And uh, I also grew with this mindset that all other countries are enemies. Uh, they want to destroy Soviet Union. They want to somehow impact our well-being. And um, it was really narrow-minded state, probably, of, of myself, of, of people, of personality, that we didn't even know that something else exists. And we couldn't um, uh, celebrate Christian uh, um, Part, like uh, days like Christmas or, or, or Easter or something. We just believed in this big propaganda machine. We believed in this communism ideology as it would be our fate. So we were stuck. We were stuck in this bubble with our small identities as a part of not our families or our real culture, but of like big ideology of big super power country, let's say. So, so we're very safe, we were very connected uh, because you know, communism was the same like collectivism, it was interlinked, it's the coexisting ideologies. So I lived in collectivism where you um, live in communities and uh, you care what others think, you have to behave accordingly what you know your social rules dictate very much, you can't be uh, free to express your opinion or creativity or something. You have to be in this small box and uh, somehow deal with everyday tasks. Would you be able to share with us some uh, real life stories in your growing up years? Uh, what are the memories that you have that uh, uh, reflect uh, this, this, this small, small world that you live in? I remember very well that, uh, you know, we were, uh, Lithuania was occupied 1941 to like these years. And my grandparents, of course, they were uh, survivors of Second World War and uh, they lived in independent Lithuania. So they really, um, you know, were recalling members of this independence, but they were not allowed to share any information because it was dangerous as half like one third of our nation was uh, deported to Siberia and killed. Like it was a real genocide. So you had to suppress your feelings. So what I remember that I lived in my grandparents' house, as most of us, right, <laughs> with grandparents. And I remember that it was this feeling that you live in the ghost house because you feel that there are some secrets, unsaid secrets, untold secrets. And I remember that uh, sometimes we would celebrate Christmas, you know, but the lights were off. It was not the Christmas tree, but uh, my grandma, she would read Bible. She would read some, you know, uh, she, she would uh, try to at least, uh, you know, give us a sense of this old traditions, you know, like she, she wanted to, to, to pass at least something. But we as a kids, me and my sister, we were told that, you, you're not allowed to talk about that. You're not allowed to tell anyone that you got Christmas gift, you know? Same was with Eastern, or there was one church where my parents secretly married and I was already born because it was not allowed to go to churches because you, could, you might be deported to Siberia, right? 
I remember queues for food, even though, you know, uh, Soviet Union announced that we're super land, but we queued for food as of 5 a.m. Let's say my mom would go, then 6 a.m. my dad would go to change her, then I would go and my sister would go, and all the time we were rotating. We were standing in this queue waiting for food, and it was not fact that we would get it. So I remember that, you know, this community, which was very supportive. Uh, in, in this community, we could share, you know, if, if, I, if I buy one product, let's say sugar, someone has milk and so on. I remember that we didn't have uh, warm water sometimes, you know, or uh, even electricity. So that was really challenging times, but still, you know, propaganda was so strong that they said it's nothing. It's nothing compared to how strong and beautiful Soviet Union is. So you might not have food or you might uh, lose your like relatives they are sending, sent to Siberia, but still love for Soviet Union and this ideology was overwhelming, you know. So I remember very vivid all these uh, stories and I remember some relatives of my grandparents who came back from Siberia uh, but we couldn't talk to them, we couldn't meet them, we couldn't have dinners or family gatherings because it was dangerous, dangerous for your life. So that was suppressed uh, commune society where we some, somehow coexist with each other with all these secrets where, which were in the air, but we, we didn't catch them, you know, so it was a House of Ghosts, as I say, you know. It, it was really, um, how to, it, it, it influenced my thinking as well, because I still today think that someone didn't tell everything what they wanted to tell, because maybe it's a, a, a part of secret life or, or secret life where, where they have to, you know, be careful. And I myself, I, I, I'm not so free as I wish I, I would be expressing myself because I think that maybe one day someone will, you know, come and not come and take me, but um, somehow um, harm me for my opinion, for my for my for my identity, for whatever. It's very deep because it, it's based on fear. My identity was based on fear and rules, so to speak. Well, like constantly having this uh, fear at the back of your head that I have to be careful for what I say because it might come back and harm me uh, at a future date. Um, uh, that that sounds uh, really scary. There is no sense of psychological safety at all. Yes, it's true because as till today, and you know, uh, it was normal uh, education at school. If you are not right or you're giving wrong answer, they would beat you sometimes, you know, depends on teacher. I talk about the Soviet Union times, not now. Now it's a totally different story. Uh, parents were beating kids because that was the culture of education. To, 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 you know, like, to inject this fear in order to control, you know? So you can't talk about self-expression here because it was simply not allowed. You have to play by the rules or you know, play or die, so to say. And of course, mm. the fear, the fear of, of being wrong or being doing something wrong or uh, doing something and then your family would suffer, that's also like very important because if I would say something or do something, my whole family might be deported to Siberia or sent to jail or tortured or, you know, lose uh, social uh, status. Uh, and... Uh, if you live in constant fear, so you can imagine what happens after all, right? Uh, it's a, uh, it's one way. It's depression. It's that there is no other really way how to rebuild yourself because if you will continue to live with this fear, so then your identity and understanding about yourself, your self-esteem, <laughs> is. Um, in a dangerous place. Hmm. Wow. So how did the Soviet Union inf 
regime re influence uh, your identity and your understanding of the world, you know, in your growing mm -hmm. up years? Then the Soviet Union crashed, you know, that was the break point where I understood that I'm empty because all my you know, childhood till say, I was teenager then and the Soviet Union collapsed. I thought that I'm one person, you know, and Soviet Union is, is a big country, like beautiful, safe, mega, you know, place to live. And then suddenly new reality struck me because I understood that no, it's wrong. This country, like Russia, occupied us. They wanted to erase us from this world by in, in, like, in, impacting all the whole propaganda to our brain, all this uh, uh, ideologies. And that this country where I lived actually was my enemy because they killed my population. So totally new reality opened, you know, in the front of my eyes. Uh, if I believe that, you know, I am like, you know, person from the amazing country. Now, you know, my collective identity was totally wrong. I mean, it was wrong, it was crashed. So who are we? Who are these Lithuanians, you know? Uh, where our roots are? Where is, you know, uh, lie and where is truth? Because, you know, then, you know, we break through this um, Soviet Union. You know, I heard totally different story. You know, if I was uh, studying history at school, they said, you know, Russia, Russia, and, you know, we are like the best. And then suddenly everything is wrong. So I became like in between, or so to say, I was empty. I didn't know who I am. Uh, that time and till today, people think that we, you know, drink vodka for breakfast, that... <laughs> because this was the identity, you know, of, of Soviet Union. And, and it was part of my identity, right? But it was not me. So I had to recreate. I didn't know who I am, what I'm good at, what are my strengths, how I have to think. I didn't know how to think because I was taught how to think. There was not independent thinking here, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to behave. I didn't know how to make decisions. I didn't know how to dress, to look, what kind of music to listen, because I had a choice now. Before I didn't have choice, I was mm. exposed, right? And now I got a choice. And what to do with this choice? And your brain is like nuts, right? Because your identity was framed. And now we have all this choice. Uh, you know, we were able to travel finally. You mm. didn't know where to go because... <laughs> The world suddenly was so big. And yeah, so it was crashed. While I was living in Soviet Union, was everything clear? Then we got independent. People didn't know how to behave, what to do mm -hmm. with this freedom, how to identify first, you know, because our ident identification also depends on uh, uh, social identity, right? Who are we? So then I understood that I'm, you know, really, really in the bad place because, um, and my parents and family, and we interact with each other, right? So their opinion, their moods, they influence our well-being, right? So my family was in a very bad place. My parents didn't have works and uh, economy cracked and crashed. And, and I was in this, you know, darkness with my thoughts. Who am I? What do, what can I offer others? And then it began, you know, then I had panic attacks. Uh, because in the middle of the night, I didn't know how my future, future would look like, right? Because everything is unknown. I didn't have the basis uh, or like, uh, yeah, foundation to start from. And uh, my health was going down and down, and uh, mental health. And I was then, uh, my diagnosis was um, uh, veget vegetative uh, depression. I got into mood of this depressive being where everything was dark, I couldn't sleep, I was not interested in anything. I was studying by that time, but my memory was uh, totally empty. I couldn't remember things. I couldn't really uh, build new relationships because I didn't know who am I. So how can I really interact with people not knowing 
And then I understood uh, my brain tricked me. And uh, then I was building my identity accordingly to others' opinion. So I was trying to be good to everyone except myself, just to please others and to get this feedback in order to understand who I am, right? If you do a good job, people are saying, oh, yeah, well, you're very cool, you're very good. And then I'm thinking, oh, I'm good, right? Or I dress like someone else is dressing and they're giving me compliments. So I think that this is the way to dress. So my identity, you know, from very firm through the freedom time when it was collapsed, I tried to build my new identity based on other people's opinion. You know, I wanted to get feedback from them and build. So I became very easy to manipulate with, you know, because mm. I wanted to please everyone. So, and this was second burnout of mine, which my depression went even deeper, you know, and I had very, very hard thoughts. You know, uh, I got into depressants, I went to psychologists, you know, because I couldn't uh, deal with myself. I uh, was afraid to be alone. I was afraid to walk alone. I was afraid to go out because I thought that I would die because panic attacks are very strong and they increase your fear of death and uh, all these things. I couldn't survive. I was like 20 years old and I was crying if I had to stay alone home. It was really unbearable situation. So I was prescribed uh, all these medicines, uh, but um, we didn't have fashion of going to psychologists on a daily basis. We didn't have psychologists that time, actually, mm. you know, after all this um, crisis. So one day I was sitting uh, in my dormitory and uh, it was sunny and in my small room I had balcony and I was looking at this balcony and I thought either I jam or I live. It was really breakthrough point where I decided that it's enough. You know, I have to do something with that. And uh, so I started to read a lot about depression. I started uh, from the point where I realized that I'm in the mode of victim because then we lose our identity and you can lose your identity in many ways, not just you know, from, uh, uh, like from Soviet Union to freedom, but also if you lose your uh, family or you lose your health or you have any you know, problems, your identity, your self-perception perception is very you know, turbulent. So, and most of us, we are going into mood of victim. We start to think that we are victims of regime, of uh, behavior of other people. So, you know, we in this place where, you know, we think that really it's uh, everyone else is guilty, but not me for my well-being, right? Uh, so I decided to try to get out of this status quo. So I told myself, I don't want to be victim anymore. I want to be winner, right? And then I start to build environment around me. Like I start to check on people. I found positive people whom I would like to be around with and people whom I can trust and tell my story and be supportive when I need. And then I have you know, these uh, bad times. So I build this environment around me. Then uh, I start to talk actually. Talking is a very powerful tool. Then you open up and you tell people, this is how I feel, and I need help. And uh, I, I looked for this help, and I found it. I was very, like, I'm very happy that, that these people, until today, I'm very grateful for them, that they were around me and helped through this old transition. Uh, another thing I understood that gratefulness is also one of the very important tools which can help you to go through hard times because I understood that even though uh, I lived in this uh, regime, right, there are some good things out of it which I can use. And uh, let's say this feeling of community, respect, um, uh, help each other, this empathy, which was really much uh, promoted in Soviet Union. Is, these are good things, right? I can take something good from that. And I was thankful for this regime that they, you know, injected those good qualities in, into me, you know. What, and um, 
Then, of course, movement is super important. You have to move. Uh, for instance, I am a big fan of dances. So I was dancing all the time. I was into sports. I was running marathons. I was uh, playing basketball. Uh, I was uh, also in arts. Arts is also a very good place to be Then you're depressed and you want to express yourself. If you are a more introverted person, you can't really express like or with words. So it's very good to play with colors. So I painted until today I do that as well. And um, positive thinking, which is extremely important, but you have to get to this point step by step. And that time I didn't know what it is, but uh, today I can tell uh, that uh, I started to think differently, you know, to see uh, good, like it is, it is related to gratefulness, you know, that you see good things. You start to really appreciate things. And now, if not this crisis of identity, probably I would not be so strong or um, empathetic or being able to help others if I would not struggle all this time. So, yeah, so that, 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 that was this uh, road to my own personal freedom and my own identity based on my needs, based on my feelings, based on my cultural surrounding, but not forced by others, let's say, and not taken from others as a, um, as a, how to put that, as a, it, it, it was not influenced by others, so to say, in, in short, you know, that uh, either regime or people I wanted to be liked. So through all this road I now mentioned, you know, I came to the point that I'm free now to create myself from inner resources more than from outside resources. Mm. Wow. So... Eva, I hear you saying how in the beginning you were so lost and you were in this like really dark place. You have no idea who you are. You you receive conflicting information about who you are, what you should believe in, what your country is about, and um, you were shaped by other people's opinions because uh, you you wanted to please them. You had no sense of self that that you can own for yourself. And, you know, this that place where there was depression, there was panic attacks in the middle of the night, confused identity, sense of hopelessness, uh, it, it, until there was even a, a, a breaking point where you were standing at the at your balcony and, and, and deciding whether you should jump. So that's really like a life so-called has pushed you to the end point. And... And I noticed that everything starts to change because you made a decision. The, the, you, you turn the turning point where you know life might have ended for you, but you made a different choice in that moment. You made a conscious decision um, to stop being the victim regardless of what your environment looks like. And then you were very proactive doing many different things and even enrolling your community in to, to develop that um, that that space for support for everyone so it really started from that point isn't it where you ask yourself that question either i jump or i do something about it everything starts to change after you yes yes i was totally down and i think that most of us you know um i think it's normal uh, to there is no I, I i could tell now from my experience that i didn't need any person or like person who didn't go for some struggles. The main thing here is to stop, to make a small pause and decide for yourself where, which direction you're going. Because we all struggle in one or another way. And we are able to choose. This is a gift, you know. We are human beings, you know, and we can choose what we want to do. It doesn't mean that it will be easy. It doesn't mean that you will do that in one day or one month. But once you chose, your brain starts to work differently. You told yourself loud out that I choose to live and to live as quality life as I can and do 
everything what depends on me because we all know and especially in these times that not everything depends on us and not everything we can control but there is a part in our life where we are responsible and we can control it and as i told as well and mentioned it's very important to understand this status quo am i victim or am i winner because if you choose to be to be you know winner that doesn't mean that you will win everything but you switch your brain towards some positive thinking because then your brain you know subconsciously start to look for support because to become winner uh, let's say i was in length, length athletics right i was also running for my school and then later on marathons once you, i decided that i want to do that right i start to collect or as i say you switch on universe you know you switch on universe and then something becomes like some small miracles start to happen you know someone offers you a good trainer someone offers you a plan of good food i'm talking now about running right and if you choose to leave the status quo of victim you like you will start to attract different people uh you know you start to listen to positive music you see, you know, flowers around you, you enjoy sun, you, you know, you, you start to collect those positive supporters. But if you choose to stay in victim, and it's our conscious, you know, choice, then you can't expect that your life quality will improve and that other people will come and take you from there. First, you have to make decision. And while decision is made, then everything goes but this point is very, very um, emotionally powerful. And I would say to get to this point, you have to go through a very hard time. Because mm -hmm. as, as we know, you know, or if we say like, like if you take arrow, right? You want to shoot. First, you have to really, really, really do tense and then you let it go, right? So this the point where you, all the powers here, right? To come to this point is quite tough. It's very much of, you know, energy. And then it goes. But you have to get make a decision to let it go. To get out of this victim. So this, this, this is my experience, how it worked with me, for me. Well, because that is uh, such a decisive uh, moment for you, that's when you kind of shift the wheel, the direction where your life was going. So I'm very curious, what helped make your decision in that moment when you were asking yourself if you would choose to jump or if you would choose to do something else? What, what made you choose the better decision? Uh, I was thinking about my uh, parents about my friends and about how much I would miss because sometimes that moment can last for one week or one month or one year but it doesn't mean that it will last forever so we have to evaluate this this moment as it's just now maybe tomorrow I will wake up and my mood will be different or I will fall in love or maybe I will get a prize or maybe I will be offered my dream job. So standing there, first of all, of course, I was thinking, you know, how my parents would uh, feel, how my friends would feel about me, how my boyfriend that time would feel about uh, this loss. And then, of course, all these possibilities which can come your way, you know, because that moment is just a moment, even though it's one week or one month or one year, but it doesn't mean that it lasts forever. So my brain somehow, thankfully for, <laughs> for I don't know, also universe, worked in the good way of uh, pushing me towards winner status quo. But yeah, love is everything. Love and, and hope. Hope that... It has to be, it must be good. 
if you're in such a bad point, you know, it must be better. There is no, if you're already standing and deciding to live or, or to, to die, right? So what else can be worse? That's it, you're in the bottom. So this hope that from here you can go slowly up, it's very strong, you know? I, I thought about, yeah, like love, of hope, and lost opportunities in the future. Probably these three things which really pushed me back to life and thought, no, I'm strong enough to deal with that. Uh, thank you for making the more empowering choice. I gave me the opportunity to meet you during our post-grad positive <laughs> psychology and to be able for you to come on this show and to share your, your learnings and your really precious life lessons with all of us. And um, it comes to mind uh, what we have already learned from our positive psychology class that at the end of the day, the factor that is known to be the biggest contributing factor for happiness and, and well-being for people is relationship. So I'm not surprised to hear that the, the first thing that came to your mind when you were trying to decide should I jump or not is your parents and uh, your friends and you know your your boyfriend what would they how would they feel if you actually do decide to jump and that was your very first consideration then followed by oh what am i missed out in life if i actually end it all so um i think it's very powerful when you hear it from a real life story like yourself versus you know when you hear just the research i think uh, the what the research say is very real in all of our lives and it's what keep us holding on even though we are at a point of breaking point for you. Yeah, uh, so, uh, as I told, you know, support is probably a crucial thing and support from people whom you trust, whom you can have fun with, whom you can cry with, whom you can tell honestly what's going on. So that's it's crucial, at least for me. And now while uh, traveling the world and changing places, that's the most important thing for me that I'm landing a new country, is to create a social environment for myself, supportive, where I can feel that I have wall behind me or friends to be with. So this factor is crucial. And this is, uh, as I told, you know, collectivism, where I grew, and now it's more like my country is more turning into individualistic, you know, uh, setup. So I dearly miss this collectivism in the good sense, in the good sense that you have this strong social environment where you can rely on. So yes, relationship is definitely one of, I would say most important thing mm. in my life. Mm. What was the biggest learning lesson for, for you, all of this? So probably this, uh, now I can say that it's this positive thinking, you know, and um, keeping hope with yourself. Whatever, what doesn't matter what will happen, just keep hoping. Have this hope, first of all, that you can make it because we have plenty of unrealized strengths which can lead us through life. Secondly, faith in in better better future, you know, universe, religion, I don't know, whatever, but it has to be faith in your life. And uh, one more thing, which is very important. If you, if you struggle, if you somewhere, you know, in the bad place, you have to understand that it will not last forever that it will change, it will 100% change. So it's also probably related to hope, but hope and faith and support, you know. I, mm. I think so. And also like that, you know, uh, lesson that um, you have to trust yourself. You, you have to trust that you will make it. You have to trust uh, that you will make it mm, self-belief. And, and feel as a winner, I'm not talking about Olympic Games winner or millionaire or, but winner with all your capacity. What, I mean, because we all have different capacities to deal with things, right? So to believe in yourself that 
your you are enough that you have enough energy and capacity to deal with things and hope for better future because it will come anyway hmm. so um how did all of this experience shape who you are today and the work that you do? I became uh, probably a very good people's reader, if I can say so. I can, I can really feel people and I can read them and I can read them, the emotions because I went from very wide <laughs> spectrum of emotions. And I can really name them and see on people and also see where they're struggling. It's like a doctor, you know. <laughs> but that's a gift. It's a pure gift of my experience that I can read people, so to say, right? Uh, I know how to trigger motivation. This gave me a big tool. You know, my experience, you know, gave me tools how to motivate people because I know which buttons to press a positive you know result and uh, it also gave me consciousness because i lived in unconscious world when i was told what to do and i learned how to be conscious and uh, this awake awakeness of consciousness it's a big big thing for me because i see world differently now from what it was like 20 years ago. And I read world differently. I, I yeah. So it's, it's a very big thing for me personally. Mm -hmm. What would you like to say to people who are going through their own crisis at the moment? Mm -hmm. I would like to say that they would not be afraid of the dark emotions because they're normal and we have hard times and it's normal to feel low, bad, to struggle, to cry. Uh, it's probably also normal to lose sometimes your identity, identity because we are, you know, living in the world, not in the room, uh, you know, and we face different, uh, you know, situations and challenges. So first of all, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to have this deep, strong emotions, which are unpleasant, but they are necessary for your growth, first of all. Secondly, don't be afraid to go to that point, breakthrough point, you know, and uh, I'm sure that most of you uh, still somewhere deep inside feel this hope, feeling of, of hope, you have it inside, right? So, uh, and then you in this, point where you really don't know what to do, where to go, choose a winner, to, to become a winner because it's worth so much more than to stay in victim or be in this lethargic, lethargic like sleep, you know, where you, you're not conscious about your, your well-being, about who you are. So just don't be afraid and try new things, try and ask for help. If you see that you can't deal with things yourself or the emotions are too strong and you can't bear, it's normal and very welcome to ask for help. And sometimes one word you will hear can change your mental status quo in a few days. You know? So don't be afraid. Take your emotions as they are. Uh, be friends with those emotions. Don't neglect them. Don't escape them. Don't pretend that they don't exist. Just be, you know, in this emotional sensation with yourself. Ask for help and hope. Hope for better because the better tomorrow always comes. Sooner or later. A better tomorrow will always come. Hmm. That's definitely a statement of hope. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's definitely true, at least in my story, <laughs> in my life story. Yeah. Wow. So um, as someone trained in positive psychology yourself, looking back at that part of your life, 
um, uh, what are your thoughts and what do you think really supported you during that difficult time? I, I probably that was you know in my life it was um, this subconsciousness subconscious hope which I didn't crystallize to know that I have it. Um, probably optimism as well is very important you know but this is not easy to learn I would say you know sometimes we you we are born with some kind of feelings we you know more introverts or extroverts mm. or optimist pessimist you know you can train that of course um, and I think uh, uh, beside what I already mentioned that you know relationship that you have to have friends around and build you know positive positive not toxic positive relationships that you have to have hope that you have to trust yourself that you have to know your strengths and dig deeper to find more and more because it's never ending story we we, we have so much inner capacities we can't even imagine right uh to be brave you know to to try uh, to be creative with the ways you treat yourself and uh, in general creativity you know it's very important i think for people creativity not just to paint or or, or, or music or, or or dancing but also the ways you can get out of the situation you know what what plan a b c because it never happens if you choose one way and it's the one, the one, right? To have a plan B and plan C. But um, if we're talking about positive uh, psychology, it's that uh, create your subject because there's objective uh, or positive, you know, like how we, we, what kind of things influence our like well being, but uh, there is the part of subjective which is very personal. So if we know objective uh, uh, things which influence our like well-being, like money and uh, relationship and others, but there are subjective uh, things which influence our and this subjective is very important to find the inner capacity, uh, how to rebuild your energy, what kind of resources you need for your energy to be rebuilt. It can be everything. Uh, uh, if we talk about the life tree, probably you remember as well, there is this life tree where you draw your life tree. What are your resources, right? What are your values? What are your beliefs? What are your goals, right? So everything starts from resource. You have to find a resource which will help you to go through this or to reach some, uh, some, some goals. And this goal can be just survive one day or survive one week. It not necessarily has to be some, you know, career or something, but just to get how to get out of the situation. So you personally have to really well understand where you get energy from. This is what I understood from my experience about, and, and if we interlink with positive uh, psychology. Resource, how I rebuild myself and I, how can I help myself? Maybe one will sleep 10 hours straight, Another will dance 10 hours, and someone will, you know, uh, cook super nice dish which gives them, you know, energy and uh, empowers them to, mm. to, I don't know, to do many other things. So, resource is very important, of course. And um, yeah, belief and hope and support. Mm. Mm. So I guess resilience is an ongoing day, isn't it? It's, it's an ongoing thing. And it, so it has to be sustainable. It has to be renewable. Knowing yourself, having that self-awareness, knowing uh, what what uh, energizes you, what really gives you that spark, uh, knowing how to rebuild your own reservoir, your inner resources, your beliefs, and having that also outer environment to support you so that you can continue to build on your Resilient um, is definitely important so that your resilient is ongoing. So, wow, like uh, time flies. Like it has always almost been an hour diving deep into uh, what uh, helped you survive that period to where you are today and how it has shaped you. So you're now not only um, doing well yourself, but supporting other people and wanting to make a difference as well out there in the world. 
So is there anything else, Eva, that you would like to add? I don't know, you know, the thing is that um, we can trick our brain. <laughs> and actually, as my granddad told me once, it, it, it doesn't cost anything to smile. And we know if we start even with fake smile, you know, after one week, if we will practice every morning in front of our mirror to smile first fake, then maybe not so fake, middle fake, <laughs> less fake. And one day we will smile to ourselves very honestly. And it's also a very good tool. We have so many simple tools to help ourselves. So I would say, you know, whatever matters, keep smiling because this can trick your brain for positiveness, you know. If you smile at yourself and you look at yourself smiling, your brain thinks that you're happy. And then, you know, you're happy. It's not as easy as it sounds, but if you practice that, for sure, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you will su succeed that. It helped me a lot, actually. Okay, I shall bear that in mind, especially when I feel stressed and I really don't have the mood to <laughs> smile. I shall try and smile yes, more. Smile. <laughs> and I think of Eva <laughs> when I smile. <laughs> yeah. Okay, wow. Thank you so much for coming to share what was a very challenging and difficult period of your life. Uh, I'm sure that our audience have benefited from all your advice. Um, thank you for being able to uh, make time and being willing to come on the show to share all your precious life lessons. So at this point, I'm going to share one resource, one other resource that uh, everyone can consider. And this is our strongest self course which is a combination of strength development and well-being strategies. So I'm going to show you a very short video about the strongest self cost.
Okay, thank you, Eva, for coming on the show. I hope uh, you had fun sharing. Totally. I, I hope it will help someone. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sure yeah. it definitely will. Okay, so we're going to end our show on a high note with our superpower poll. Awesome. Thank you so much for watching to the next episode, everyone. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye. <laughs>